Well, I guess this is us. Tur take a hymnal, if you will, turn to him 520. 520. serving the sweeter he grows well I appreciate you being here tonight we're going to have just a, a brief service and then our business session but uh, I want to allow for those who are interested in going down to the memorial service for Summer's mama Gayla Daldrell down at Overflow it starts at 7 o'clock so um, thank you for those of you who are able to come and be a part of the service that we had down at uh, Hillcrest this afternoon. Had a, a really sweet time. I, well, we had 17 or 18 folks that were there from our church and uh, probably 20 plus from uh, people there at the, at the nursing home. And they enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. We just worshiped the Lord, sang some songs, and just had a sweet time together. Come back. We're going, we're going back. Matter of fact, I think uh, my understanding is they have not had a church come on the third Sunday of the, the month, and so we're going to step in and fill that for a while. So uh, you'll have an opportunity to go with us. I hope you will take advantage of that. It's a, it's a very precious, precious time. Tonight, if you've got your Bible, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 4, I want to talk to you about, it's just one sentence is all it is, but it's a sentence that just, uh, when I read it, in the context of the story that's being told, uh, it just makes me long for that to be said about me. And uh, 
it's something that I, I'm so far away from it, but I just, I'm, that's, that's, anyway. Acts chapter 3 begins with the story of, of Peter and John going to the temple. And they were going there about 3 o'clock to go and pray. And when they entered, there was a, a man that had been crippled uh, that was begging at the gate. You remember the story, right? Remember they walked up and, and uh, I, I can just see it. I can, just, I, can, I can see it. The man holding out uh, his hand, asking for, for, for money, for assistance. And they look at him and they, they, that classic line, you know, silver and gold, I do not have, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Kind of powerful. And then Peter took the man by the right hand, helped him up as he did. Man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, began to walk. I think he began to walk, began to talk, began to dance. I just my my opinion. But don't you think there would be some joy going on in that man's life at that moment? You see, he'd been lame for 40 years. 40 years. Well, you can imagine what happened. As, and I know that you've probably read the story, know the story, and of course, the church people weren't real happy with what happened. They confronted him. Want to know by whose name, by whose power did you do this? What did, how did you do this? And this is after Peter gets up and preaches at the temple. After they were amazed, the people who were celebrating with the man who had been healed, there were those who were celebrating with him. And, and then Peter preaches, and then he gets confronted uh, by those that were on the council. And he was, they were actually arrested. And having been arrested, they were uh, held overnight. They were brought before the rulers and the elders and the teachers of religious law in Jerusalem, the high priest and others. And they said, uh, let's see, this is chapter 4, verse 7. It says, they brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no other name. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Can you just get, a, just get the feeling of you know, the intensity with which Peter begins preaching again? You know, he just preached it the day before uh, in the temple after the healing, and now he stands before the leaders of the temple, the leaders, the high priest and others, and he goes into preaching to them. He says, the members of the council were amazed. They were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the Scriptures. And here's the sentence. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Think about it. Would you like to be known in life as a man or a woman who simply by recognition, by what they were proclaiming, what they were saying, by their words as well as their actions, they were recognized as men who had been with Jesus. I don't know about you, but that is one, that's one of the most powerful statements that I believe could be said about anybody. And here's the truth. We know the story behind Peter. We know the beginning. We know the middle. And we know the denial. 
And then we come into Acts, and Peter is not this, this man is not the same man that we knew of who had been with Jesus. And so I want to I want to share with you just three quick things tonight that I believe that make a difference when we've been with Jesus. When we've been with Jesus, it changes how we love. Absolutely. You remember me reading this morning, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, kind, not envious, not jealous. I, and I, I start paraphrasing, I'll mess it all up. But love, in the context of that, you can take it, and as I did this morning, substitute the name of Jesus, and Jesus is love. Having been with Jesus, it changes the way we love. It changes the way we love one another. It changes the way we love God. Because when you've been with Jesus, you have a deeper understanding of who God is and who Jesus is. It changes the way we love the Word of God. Having been with Jesus, you realize that that Word that you carry around with you everywhere you go. That word that you carry with you is a living word. It's active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it will never return void to the Father. It's, you'll fall in love with God. You'll fall in love with Jesus. Your, your love will grow deeper for the word of God. And your love will grow deeper for the people of God. Being with Jesus, how do we do that? You stop and look at these guys. How long did they spend with him? Physically, how long did they spend with him? Anybody know? Three years. They walked with him for three years. They walked with him, talked with him, listened to him. They'd been with him. But what we see evidenced here, that the recognition factor that came from the high priest and the people from the temple, it didn't come as a result direct, it, it came as, if they had seen those guys before the resurrection, or before Pentecost even, they may not have said what they said here. Because the difference that was made in Peter, and I'm supposing the difference that was made in John as well, was once they experienced the power of the Spirit of God within them. It empowered them with a boldness and a genuine love for Jesus more so than ever before. Because they finally understood who He is, who He was, who He is, and who He desires for them to be. So, being with Jesus changes the way you love. Being with Jesus changes your loyalty. Think about it. Peter's loyalty pre-crucifixion, day of the crucifixion. Was he there? He wasn't real loyal, was he? He denied Jesus three times. And he told he <laughs> he cussed him out. He cursed him. He said, you know, I never knew him. No, I'm not a part of the group. But once Jesus had completed the task that God had laid before him, and once the Spirit of God came on him, being with Jesus changed his loyalty. Because guess what happens in chapter 4? From this sentence on, once they've recognized, they bring him, and they, he continues preaching a little bit, and then finally they've heard enough, and they said, said they sent him out, because they, they, they didn't know what to do. They sent, they sent him out of the room so they could talk, and they, they talked and said, you know, we, we, we can't punish him because uh, it might start a riot. We, what do we do? Well, let's call him back in and, and just let him have it. That's my paraphrase. You'll not find that in your scripture. Let's let them have it and tell them to not to do it anymore. Now, the Peter that we encountered on the day of the crucifixion would have probably 
received what they said and done as they wished. What happened? They come back in. They bring them back in, and they do. They, they let them have it. They tell them, it's, don't do this anymore. Don't preach the name of Jesus. Don't talk about it. Peter looks, him, looks at them, stares at I mean, he's right there in front of them. Not, he, he confirms this, are we to do what you tell us, or are we supposed to do what God tells us to do? These were men who had been with Jesus. Being with Jesus changes your love. Being with Jesus changes your loyalty. Being with Jesus takes us another step further. Not only your love and your loyalty, but being with Jesus literally changes your life. Literally changes your life. Think about it. Think about it. The idea that you can meet Jesus and it not affect your lifestyle is completely foreign to what the Bible teaches. Scripture makes two things very clear. First of all, you don't have to change your life in order to get saved. Got your attention? You don't have to change your life in order to get saved. Second thing is, you, if you truly get saved, you'll have to change your life. You say, well, that's, aren't you saying the same thing? I've had people tell me before in presenting the gospel to them, you know, I need to do that. I want to do that. But I'll do it once I get my life straight. They feel like there's changes that they've got to make before they can receive Christ. The, this, whether it's the sin in their life or the, the, whether it's just simple justification of, of not wanting to, to make that change, knowing that if you do receive Christ, there really ultimately is a change. The change happens because you want it to happen. You want to please the Father if you truly get saved. So it changes our life. Scripture also tells us that uh, we talked to, I talked to you this morning about wearing the hand-me-downs of Christ and that when you wear the hand, you know, I asked you what happens when you put somebody else's clothes on. You smell like them. Good or bad. Sweet or sour. When you've been with Jesus, you take on the sweet aroma of Christ. I don't know about you, but that sounds awfully good. Damon, I don't know if you remember, but I, it was probably the first month I was here. I preached a message about how do you smell before the Father. And going back to Leviticus, and... Uh, talking about that sacrificial sacrifice that was made over and over and over again in Leviticus. Every time it would talk about the sacrifice that was made, it was done as a pleasing aroma before God. And I asked the question, how do you, can Jesus smell, can people smell Jesus on you? That was the last question I asked. And I remember you walked out the door that day, and I hugged your neck, you hugged mine, you whispered in my ear, can you smell Jesus? I said, I absolutely. I don't know about you. I want to carry his aroma. I want to be known. I want to be recognized and, and have seen people see that I have been with Jesus. Not for my glory, but for God's glory. I don't want it for me. I just, I, I want, I want that kind of a experience. So what about you? Have you been with Jesus? How do we be with Jesus? We be with Jesus when we pray. We be, we're with Jesus when we read the scripture. We're with Jesus when we're together with one another. We're with Jesus when we have our quiet time. And the truth is you're with Jesus every moment of the day if he's part of you. The key, though, is recognizing it, acknowledging it, and living it. So, 
Here's my challenge to you, and this will be it. Spend some time with him this week. Maybe just maybe a little bit more than you normally do. I'm not saying you don't spend time with him, but spend some extra time with him and see if it doesn't make a difference. Let go of something else in your life that is occupying that time and give it to Jesus. I can promise you it will make a world of difference. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you, Father, for the example that we see in Peter and John. And may we be known as people who have been with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to call us into a business session.